Good morning and welcome to this week's online worship with Regent Hall Salvation Army. I, I hope you've had a good week and I hope you're keeping safe, sane and sanitised. Welcome to worship today. Today, amongst other things, we're going to be looking at our self-denial appeal and uh, thinking about what we may be able to give up in order to be able to give some financial support to other territories within the Salvation Army. But as a call to worship today, I'm going to read the words of Psalm 15 and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Our main text for today is actually from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 9, but these supporting verses from Psalm 15 are used now as a call to worship. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter into your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbours, or speak evil of their friends. Those who despise flagrant sinners and honour the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. Amen. Well, I think I should go home now except I am already home, but maybe I shouldn't be here to worship. Can we claim to live rightly, as one translation says, or to lead blameless lives, as the verses we heard said? Of course, David raises a question that concerns all religious people. Who will God honour to live in his presence? The answer David gives reflects a typical Old Testament answer. God will honour those who live blameless lives. Thankfully, today, we know that the New Testament turns that idea on its head. Although the New Testament praises right living, it changes the basis for salvation to grace rather than living blameless lives. It's about what Jesus has done for us rather than anything we can do. And so we can settle down and focus our minds ready to worship knowing that it's not about us, but all about Jesus.
We're going to have a time of prayer together now, so let's pray. Father God, thank you that you stand with open arms to receive us into your presence today. Thank you that you welcome us just as we are, with all the imperfections that are unique to each one of us. And thank you that you love us enough that you want us to be the best us we can be and that you give us all we need to grow like Jesus more each day. Thank you that you rejoice over us with dancing. Thank you that we have this opportunity to worship today. We pray that it would be acceptable to you, that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. There are so many things we want to bring to you today, our own personal concerns and worries, concerns that we have about many things happening in the world. We place all the things which crowd our thinking, our concerns and our worries at the foot of the cross and we thank you that we can leave them there with you. I thank you for every person worshipping right now and I pray that you will meet the needs of their hearts, that they will feel your touch upon them, be with them and with those that they love. May your Holy Spirit fill each one of us as we worship you today and prepare us for the day and the week that lie ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. And maybe now you'll join with me in saying the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and Amen. So it's that time again within the Salvation Army calendar for our self-denial appeal. We're going to watch a film in just a, a little while called Beyond Borders, where Captain Ben Cottrell will be telling us about the self-denial appeal and the territories that we'll be supporting this year. There will be a link so that you can watch the other films that have been made to show the different territories and the different places we'll be supporting and you can watch these using the link at your own leisure. The Salvation Army in the UKI Territory will be supporting Burkina Faso and Mali, Bangladesh, the Philippines and Pakistan. These are the places that we've supported in previous years and we continue to support them and the videos that are available for you to see talk about the different areas of support that we've been able to provide through the self-denial appeal. So I just ask you that you will pray about the self-denial appeal and there will be details in the coming weeks of just how you can give your offering to the self-denial appeal through the Regent Hall Salvation Army. So thank you in advance and I pray that you will be blessed as you are a blessing to people that we may never meet but who God loves as his own children. Thank you, God bless. Hello and welcome to the first of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. My name is Ben Cottrell and as we live through the various lockdown measures in place across our territory, I'm going to be looking beyond our borders. For this year's Self-Denial Appeal, I'm going to focus on some of the places we've featured in previous appeals and catch up with people we've met along the way to find out how they've been coping during the pandemic. But first, let's look at last year's appeal. Last year, we travelled to the city of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. We met Andre and Nana Togo and saw some of the amazing things that they're doing there. We saw a thriving corps full of enthusiastic new soldiers and we saw how the Salvation Army is supporting people in the local community. You gave generously once again. Thank you so much. Your self-denial money is already being put to good use. And as a little reminder about how self-denial works, here's Ashley Bowles who presented our films a couple of years ago. The money you gave through self-denial is used to support the mission of the Salvation Army around the world, including our mission partners. The idea of self-denial was first introduced in London by William Booth in 1886. He said, go without something and give what you would have spent to the Salvation Army's work. 
That was over 130 years ago. Now, nearly every Salvation Army Corps the world over plays its part. So if you are giving in London, Clanethley, Larne or Lockerbie, you are joining with Salvationists in Oslo, Ohio or Ouagadougou, which is the capital city of Burkina Faso. The money is redistributed by international headquarters to the places that need it most. It funds the background things, the not so exciting but essential things, so that Salvation Army staff and volunteers can get on and do what they're good at, like the work in Burkina Faso. Well, as Ashley has reminded us, some of the self-denial money you raised goes to our mission partners, but quite a lot goes to other mission support work all over the globe. Mission support was crucial in enabling the work in Burkina Faso as the Seedling Salvation Army took root and began to flourish. For over a year, I've had the privilege of working for the International Development Team at Territorial Headquarters. It's given me a further insight into the international work of the Salvation Army, and I've been involved in some of the projects which have been funded by Self Denial. I live here at William Booth College with my wife Rebecca and our two children. And in a few weeks' time, we'll be moving to a court in East London. But this time last year, we were waiting for visas to go and work in Pakistan. Like so many other people around the world, our plans were disrupted by the global pandemic. Of course, lots of people have faced real hardship, and while it's been frustrating for us, we are well and healthy, so we are grateful for that. As we adjust to this change for us, and as we think about self-denial, I want to find out about how the Salvation Army around the world has adapted. So for the next five weeks, we'll be revisiting some of the places we've been to before. I'll be asking people how they're coping and what life is like where they are. I'll be talking to Fozia Columbus in Pakistan. She featured in 2016 when Kerry Koch visited the Salvation Army's territorial headquarters in Lahore. I'll be talking to Melinda Boone from the Philippines. Melinda features in the Salvation Army's Helping Hand Appeal films from last year. She works in anti-human trafficking. I'll be talking to Richard Bradbury. Richard and his wife Heidi have been serving in Bangladesh for the last two and a half years. They're there with their two children and work at headquarters in Dhaka, the country's capital. But next week, we'll pick up where we left off last year. I'll be talking to Nana Togo, who we saw in Burkina Faso. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Today comes from a member of the Regent Hall staff team, our operations manager, Judith Stobart. Now, Judith started working at Regent Hall just one month before I did, which means she will have completed nearly five years. But you may well have read in the newsletter that Judith is moving on to pastures new. She's going to have a new adventure as she joins the Latimer Church and works for them. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to Judith for all that she has brought to Regent Hall, her gifts and her laughs and all the cake and so much more.
but I'd also ask you all to pray for Judith as she steps out on this new road and that she will know that God is surrounding her in all these days. I was so pleased that Judith said yes to sharing her testimony with us today. So thank you, Judith. Hi, I'm Judith. I'm lockdown has been very strange. I um, can't believe that we are almost round I'm at a year already. Um, this time last year, I was looking forward to skiing holiday, uh, heading across Northern Ireland to see friends. Um, and yeah, really thankful that I got both of those things in before lockdown happened. Um, so yeah, this last year, I really missed being able to do different things, go different places, see friends, see family, uh, see my nieces and nephews as they run around and have lots of fun. Um, yeah, all of the things that so many of us, uh, everyone is missing out on. Um, so, um, but yeah, things that have got me through um, have been still able to do WhatsApp calls, Zoom calls, video chats with um, friends and family. I am great to have the technology to be able to do that and still see um, and share the moments, um, even though they're not in person. Um, yeah, I guess having spent so much time in my own company this year has been an interesting uh, scenario. I um, don't think I've ever had so much time on my own. I am um, just really grateful that um, the times of loneliness haven't felt too many. I've um, got so many wonderful people in my life that um, it is great that you know, there's always somebody who just... Uh, messages or rings or send some um, funny little uh, video clip through that just seems to be at the right time uh, that means that um, I know I am not alone and uh, also with those friends and family who um, share bible verses encouragements uh, send me um, verses that have um, helped them uh, and inevitably then they uh, in turn encourage me so uh, and also being able to do that I am um, for other people too I'm um, great privilege to be in each other's lives uh, however different that has looked this year I am um, so just really thankful to God for um, putting me uh, in so many people's lives and putting so many people into my life I am um, and um, yeah, hopefully throughout this last year and on into this year, um, we'll continue to encourage and bless each other um, in whatever way that uh, takes form. Um, my um, hopes for 2021 um, would be to be able to meet up with people again. Um, to have coffee and cake with people, just to sit and watch the world go by, and um, yeah, just to um, walk alongside people um, rather than having to send them uh, a message or just talk to them while I'm walking. Um, but uh, and I think I'm um, yeah, a verse that strikes me and um, encourages me. Um, is Romans 15 verse 13 and I guess that would be my prayer uh, for this coming year um, and that is may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>
Our Bible reading today comes from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 9 and verses 51 to 62. I asked Cadet Emily Haig if she would bring us our Bible reading for today. Emily has been worshipping with us at Regent Hall since she went to the William Booth College to join the Messengers of Reconciliation session. And she worships with us when she can, obviously college commitments allowing. And uh, so I've asked Emily to share with us these verses today. Thank you, Emily. The reading for today is taken from Luke and it's chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
Today's Bible reading is a difficult one. It's confrontational and it doesn't leave us much wiggle room. Right at the end of the reading, Jesus says, no one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Challenging words to hear, don't you think? Especially if we ask ourselves a few questions. Are we looking towards the kingdom or are there other things that distract us? Are we responding to God's calling on our lives or would we rather be doing other things that look more appealing, easier or more exciting? Are we open to the future that God has in store for us or do we have our own plans? Jesus is calling us into question and that's never easy, fun or comfortable. He's calling into question the direction our lives are taking, the values that we hold and how we are living and embodying those values. Jesus is really asking us to do some self-reflection rather than looking at others, those who look, act and believe differently from us, the Samaritans that James and John were wanting to call fire down upon. Now Samaritans for us today may be those who have different religious or political beliefs, those who are from other countries, races or cultures, to name but a few. Basically, anyone who pushes our buttons could be a Samaritan in our lives. Those people who, when you see or hear them, make you bristle. Those people who, when they say things, make you have those imaginary conversations in your head. And let's be honest, those sorts of conversations never end well, do they? The verses we heard earlier make for uncomfortable reading because they do not let us turn away from people or situations that are right in front of us, or the future that is ahead of us. Jesus sees and holds intention the lives in which we live. In one breath, we say to God, I'll follow you wherever you go. But in the next verse, uh, in the next breath, we say, but, but first, but first let me do this, or but first let me go there. I know that's been true for me. We live in the everyday, but when it comes to the future, we move with an attitude of but first. In our Bible reading, we had the story of three men who encountered Jesus. Three men who potentially could have become followers of Jesus, but Jesus himself puts two of the men off. When one said, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Not greatly encouraging words, are they? Then another chap says, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. To which Jesus replies with the very challenging words that we heard earlier. No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Again, you might think that Jesus would be a bit more encouraging, at least initially. You'd think he might focus on the adventure of discipleship, the opportunities that would arise to make a positive difference in the lives of others, rather than talking about tough choices, self-denial and it being a hard road to follow. Jesus himself called another guy to follow him. In verse 59 of our reading, he said, follow me. But the man replied, first let me go and bury my father. To which Jesus replies, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So again, not greatly encouraging. And this made me think, maybe we make it too easy for people to follow Jesus and don't spend nearly enough time talking about the difficulties of following Christ. Maybe if we were braver and brave enough to do that, yes, We might have smaller churches, but perhaps they would be filled with more dedicated disciples. But in principle, following Jesus is simple, isn't it? Love your neighbour as yourself, love your enemy, welcome the stranger, visit the sick and those in prison, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give the thirsty something to drink, turn the other cheek, forgive not just seven times, but 70 times seven. These are the values that Jesus holds and it's the road that he is going to travel. 
Most of us probably agree with those, valuable, with those values. And in principle, it is the road that we choose to travel when we are in relationship with Jesus. Well, that's the theory. But actually, it's much messier and harder to follow Jesus in real life than any principle or theory. I guess we're all probably in favour of love, hospitality, forgiveness and non-violence. But the reality can be more difficult when we meet the unlovable, the stranger, the unforgivable act or the Samaritan in our lives. So then maybe our initial eagerness to follow Jesus also comes with a but first attitude. Jesus, however, puts no qualifications, limitations or exceptions on where he is going, who is included or what he is offering. Jesus doesn't care who we are, where we're from or what we have or haven't done. Whatever our faith, sexuality, colour, race or status, believer or unbeliever, doesn't seem to matter to Jesus. For him, there are no conditions attached to love, hospitality, forgiveness or giving. He doesn't allow for a but first in his life or in the lives of his followers. A but first attitude is the way we put conditions on the unconditional. Yes, I will love the unlovable, but first let me see who the unlovable are, whether I like them, whether they have the same beliefs as me and whether they're agreeable to me. Yes, I will welcome the stranger, but first let me see who they are, how different they are from me, what they want and what I'm risking. Yes, I will forgive others, but first let me see if they acknowledge they're wrong. Let me see if they're sorry for what they did and if they've promised to change. Yes, I will give to and care for others. But first let me see what it will cost me, what's in it for me and if it's worth it. But first, isn't the attitude that Jesus wants? Remember how he described it in the reading? No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Perhaps it was with that verse in mind that one American preacher wrote this about living but first. It's as if we're backing our way into the kingdom while keeping one eye on the door. It's as if we're walking backwards into our future, reluctant to see or deal with what is before us. It's as if we've put our hand to the plough and have looked back. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to back my way through life. I don't want to live a but first life. I want to live my life with a heart to love the unlovable. I want to be someone who can forgive the unforgivable, welcome the stranger and give without wanting payback or even a thank you. It isn't easy, but it is worth it. So I wasn't kidding when I said that this Bible reading wasn't easy, was I? I can't say that I have the answers to give you either about how to resolve things. But thinking about it, it's not what Jesus said that we need to resolve, but rather we need to resolve ourselves and our hearts. There was nothing wrong with what Jesus said, challenging as it was. We need to resolve ourselves to being like Jesus, relating to others, in the way that he did, taking seriously the direction our lives are going in. Being on the road to Jerusalem is a choice we make every day. That means looking at the way in which we are backing through life. It means seeing the people and situations in which we've turned our backs and acknowledging that we do sometimes live but first lives rather than loving, giving, welcoming, and forgiving. I wonder what our lives would look like if we lived totally without a but first attitude. I think it could be risky and scary and look pretty crazy. But as I look at the world, listen to the news and listen to the lives and stories of others, the world is already risky, scary and crazy, isn't it? I'm not suggesting that we're silly or put ourselves in danger but actually, 
No matter how risky, scary or crazy the world is, we love a God who has promised never to leave us or forsake us. Deuteronomy 36, 31 sorry, and verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. This verse was written to encourage the people of Israel, whose lives included seemingly insurmountable challenges. God wanted them to know that they could trust him to lead them into victory. And that reassurance is ours today. So this week, try and lead with your heart rather than your butt first. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you that you are a patient God and that even though there are times when we put our butt first, you still love us and nurture us to make us more like Jesus. Help us to grow in our discipleship, to follow you more closely each day. Help us to live our best lives today, holding on to the hope of the future you have planned for us. Forgive us for the times when we don't respond with our heart and help us help make us more like Jesus each day. As we come to the end of our worship, I pray that you will be with each person here, that your blessing, protection and favour will be on them and on those that they love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow.
joining me today. Next week, the 28th of February, will be our Young People's Annual and the teaching will come from Sarah Lomax and our worship will be led by our young people at Regent Hall. So please join us next week for our worship. We look forward to seeing you then. Obviously, we are keeping in line with government guidelines. Originally, our plans were to open up for live worship again in March. But I guess we'll wait to see what the Prime Minister says this week about how he envisages us all coming out of lockdown. Be assured, though, that we will be letting you know what's happening at Regent Hall as soon as we're able to. So a benediction before we go. Let us always remember that our God is merciful and loving. God hears us when we call. May we find forgiveness and comfort in these words from Psalm 16 verse 11. God, show us the path to life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Have a good week. God bless you.